Well, good morning. Uh, it is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I'm Ken. If, uh, if I don't know you, it's good to meet you this morning. And uh, I'm excited about what the Lord is having to share. To be honest with you, uh, you, know, it, you know how everybody says, well, you shouldn't have a favorite kid? I guess as a pastor, you probably shouldn't have favorite sermon series and stuff. Man, this has been good to me. Yes, I have been... Uh, I've just been diving in. I, usually sometimes you feel like you're grinding out and digging and digging, but man, the Lord has just been so good and, and, and speaking so much uh, into the life of this series that we're in, which is called Detox, uh, because we live, in an, we live in a society, we live in a time where there's just stuff, man, and, and it, it's hard, you know? Uh, we, went, um, we went to a local dairy farm yesterday for my granddaughter's birthday. And, and it was all cool. You know, I'm not big on the smell of animals. I have a very sensitive smell. Uh, and, and they're okay because they're outside, but they asked us to go, like, inside where they milk them. And it was literally like I opened the door, and I did a circle like that and went right back out. I was like, that ain't for me, bro, whatever that smell is. And, uh, and, and you know, and it was funny because my, my brother-in-law, uh, who's an awesome guy, he, he went in. Uh, me and my wife and my sister were like, uh-uh, we're out. He went in, and when he came out, my sister just looked at him, like, wrinkled up her nose and went, mmm, you know, because he smelled like it. And I said, well, you got to ride home with him, bro. I said, dude, you ain't looking good for you today, my man, until you get a bath, so... Uh, anyway, but, um, but anyway, it's, it's kind of like that in life that, that, you know, as much as we're just along for the ride in times, there, there's just some stink that's going to get on us because we're in a corrupted world, right? And so we want to look at uh, uh, what are the things that God has done to allow us, because we're called to live differently. That's true. We are really called to live different. We just can't act like anybody and everybody. Why? If we're believers, uh, we, we're bearing his name. So we're, we're in something that's so much bigger than ourselves that, that we're not just allowed to do any old thing and act any old way. So, uh, so, so God doesn't ask us to do something and not equip us to do it. So detox is all about how has God um, uh, enabled us or given us the ability to do the things that he asked us to do. So this today, uh, we're going to dive in and we're going to talk about our soul, which we talked last week about, and I, it, I talked for a long time about it last week. So if you missed last week, you kind of got to get last week to get this week. Uh, but the gist of it is, is that is that God created us in his image. In, in Genesis 3, I believe it is, he said that, uh, that, that God created uh, God said that they would, he would, and by this I mean the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he says, let's create man uh, in, in our image, and our likeness. And so because God did that, and we're the only ones that he did that with, uh, we're, we're three parts, right? So we're, uh, we are spirit, we are soul, and we are body. Last week we talked about how these three relate, what they are. Uh, check that out if you want on our YouTube page, um, app, whatever. Uh, to catch up, but this week we're really going to hone in on on the soul. Uh, last week I told you I was going to read this scripture probably every week of this series, but it's First Thessalonians. I said I was going to read it. That Theth. <laughs> every time we do something, every Sunday we give each other a hard time on Monday about it. This is it. This is my moment. So, First uh, Thessalonians. Yes. <laughs> Every victory, every battle won, right? Uh, chapter 5, I'm not trying it again. Chapter 5, verse 23 says, And may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. In other words, let him just, let him just get into your innermost being and focus on that he himself because a lot of times we try to do it. Uh, we, I talked last week about it's as absurd as my dog giving himself a bath, right? Herself a bath. It just doesn't work. So God does it from the outside for us, which means to separate us from profane things, make us pure and wholly consecrated, right? Remember we said we're, we're part of something bigger than ourselves? That's him, to God. And may your spirit and soul and body, the three parts of us, be preserved sound and complete and found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So really what he's saying is, is that, that um, what is happening to us once we're in Christ, so you, you, you really fall into one of two categories here. You're somebody who you've received Jesus, you've said, I want him to be my Lord and Savior, or you're somebody, obviously, that's, you're either being held hostage this morning, or you're at least curious, right? And so, and so if, if you're not 
a believer in Christ and you're just fishing, then some of the things I'll say don't apply because the first step is that. Once you get that, then you move on to these other things because God wants you to come to himself before he wants to do anything else. He wants you to come as you are. He wants you to come no matter what because that's the big thing. Once that happens, then we get into this sanctifying process that we're reading about here, which is this cleaning up, uh, this uh, detox thing that we talk about. So uh, we understand that he wants a spirit, soul, and body to be preserved, complete, at the coming of Lord Jesus Christ. That's good news, right? Because he says he himself will do it. So today we're going to talk mainly about, let's show the, the slide here about the soul, right? We, we talked about these three things. Let's go to this middle one, make it the big deal. That's what we're talking about this week. So when we talk about the soul, I'm not talking about uh, this part of us is eternal. This part doesn't dissolve at death. But at the same time, uh, it's not necessarily our spirit, so to speak, God's spirit in us. This is more our mind, our emotions, our intellect. This gets into our free will. This is all the stuff, really what I would say that makes you, you, and me, me. Uh, that's the soul. That's, that's how all this stuff works. And the beauty of it is, is that we have a tremendous amount of, of responsibility, and we have a tremendous amount of control and autonomy in this. In other words, this is where God has given us the ability where we can either believe what he said, choose what he said, or choose other things. Um, this, is all, this is where all that happens. And so I want to share with you that uh, one thing that I struggled with a lot when I, was, when I was a new believer was I thought that God was grossed out by my grossness, if that makes sense. That's very technical for all you PhDs out there. Gross is a good word, right? I thought he was put off by my iniquity. I thought he was um, turned away, he would turn away from or be surprised by some of the, the, the bad things that I would think. And, and, I, and I noticed this this week as I was reading that in, in Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, it says, and the Lord was pleased. This, now, this scripture comes right after the flood receded and Noah was offering sacrifices after the flood receded. And it says that, uh, this the sacrifice Noah was offering. It says, And the Lord was pleased with the aroma and the sacrifice. And he said to himself, I'll never curse the ground, uh, curse the ground because of the human race. He had done that before. Even though everything they think or imagine is bent towards evil from childhood. I'll never again destroy all the living things. And so what God was saying was, and hopefully what we receive is that God understands that our thinking and our intellect, it's bent toward, it doesn't mean everything we do is evil. That's, that's the, uh, don't take it too far, right? We can do, we can, we're capable of good, but we are bent towards evil. And God knows that. So when you do something, uh, and, or you think something, and, and you think that God's going to uh, be, be ready to just smite you, or, or, or rub you out, or, or turn away from you, understand that he knows uh, he says it right here. These, this is God's account of God's uh, thinking about us. He says, okay, uh, so creation doesn't have to pay for man's uh, wickedness anymore. I know that man is bent that way. So we, we can look later on in Scripture and we see how does God uh, create this redemptive plan for that because God didn't intend to leave us broken, never intended for us to stay that way. And so we're going to jump way up into the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 where it says this, and this, is, this, this statement here in quotations, who can know the Lord's thoughts, who knows enough to teach him, Though, that statement is from the book of Isaiah where, where they were musing about how, how amazing is God. Well, now the apostle Paul writes this to follow it up. He says, but we understand these things. We can understand the thoughts of God. Why? Because we have the mind of Christ. So when, when, when Jesus died, when he rose, and he promised us that after him would come the Holy Spirit, when we received that, now we receive the mind of Christ, which is what I would call the antidote to the mind of Ken, to the mind of insert your name. Because now God says to me, hey, look, I want you to live a certain way, but for you to live a certain way, the reality is, is that you're going to have to think a certain way. And it can't be bent towards evil all the time. And it can't be my thoughts all the time. It has to be his thoughts, his ways, his agenda, his reaction, not mine. Because mine is messed up. We've already read that. And so what we understand now is that, is that God sends to us his, the mind of Christ. And, and sometimes we just read past that. Oh, I have the mind. Sit, think about this. What is he saying? He said that who can know the Lord's thoughts? 
Me. Me. Wow. Really? I can have the mind of Christ, and I have it, which allows me to see things in a bigger picture, right? Allows me to do things that I can't do in my mind. Remember, my mind is, is, uh, is from childhood bent towards evil. But God doesn't call me to live for evil. He calls me to live for his purposes. So he gives me the mind of Christ. That's part of the redemptive plan, right? So whenever somebody says that salvation is just about you not going to hell, that, man, I'm not saying, yeah, that, that's there, but that is like such a small percentage of the promise because God wants to redeem you here and now. God wants to help you live here and now. God wants you to be able to go into the dairy room where it stinks and come out and not stink. Does that make sense? God wants you to not get the stink on you because you're going to be in the world, but you're not going to be of the world, and the world's not going to invade you and take over your mind and your thoughts because God has a greater purpose for you and I. And so he gives us the mind of Christ who did go into some of the smelly places of the world in his life. He didn't come out stinking. Uh, he went into the most sinful environments, but yet never sinned. And so you and I need to understand that that's the mind that we have, that, that we don't have to disengage. We don't have to pull away and get away from the world, and we don't have to get in it so deep that it messes up our thinking, that, that, that we have this unique ability in Christ to be redeemed by God through this. So let's jump to another verse we talked about last week, and that is James 1.21. It says, so get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has implanted in your hearts, for it is the power to save your souls. So God plants his word in us, uh, puts it in us, and why? To save our souls. And, and I dug into this. This is not, this soul, this is this, this part of us that we're talking about. This is, so it can save our, yes, eternal, but that, this part of our soul, it is eternal, but it is our thinking. It's our thinking. Uh, our thoughts, our emotions, our intellect, our free will, that God's word can save that part of us from, from destruction. And not just eternal destruction, that's taken care of in Christ, but, but destruction now. So a lot of the destruction you and I feel, uh, it is sometimes it's self-inflicted, not all the time, but a lot of times it's self-inflicted, and yet God's word can save my soul from some of that damage and some of that pain so I can be preserved, complete, and perfect at the coming of Christ. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, it will in a minute. Uh, we're going to keep going. Just so, uh, so you guys know, and I, I didn't have them project this, so uh, Romans 8, 28. No, Romans 2, 28. Romans something. Romans 2. I think it's Romans. Anyway, it's the scripture where it talks about um, uh, that your mind, uh, being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, and, and, the, and the promise that's in that. So what he's saying basically, and I think it says this in the new translation, is that you and I, uh, that God wants to use our minds to change our lives. That by renewing our thoughts, we can change our lives. And, and it's been interesting, you know, as, as, as things go along, I'm going to start talking about some of the people that I've read and researched now, but I want to give you this analogy. I want you to picture, uh, or if you can't picture, I've pictured it for you, uh, a garden right? Uh, is that up there? Yeah. So we look at, we think about gardens and how beautiful, it, whether it's flower gardens, vegetable gardens, you know, fruit, fruit gardens, whatever. But when they are well kept and they are fruitful, some of the most beautiful places ever. I mean, they have, it's just amazing to see God's creation that way. And, and we love to see this stuff, right? We love to look at, we love to look at gardens. And, and what we have to realize is, is really this, is that, is that you and I, here's the truth, you and I are going to live off of the fruit, so to speak, that grows in the gardens of our mind. Let me say it again, because that's pretty big. You and I are going to live off of the fruit that grows in the gardens of our mind. And so you and I have to imagine ourselves as, as the tenders of a garden. And that garden is, our, is really our mind. This is our soul. This is where it, it really, really begins. And if you wonder if I'm telling the truth, think about this. Where did Satan, where did he come to Eve? In the garden. And what did he do? He attacked her by doing what? He just whispered some lies. He just planted doubt. And, she, and, and what she had to do at that moment was to choose to reject or accept the lie. And that's really, we are still we're all still Eve. We're all still having to decide whether we accept 
or, re- or we reject a lie. And so a lot of times the enemy will come and he'll speak a lie to us. And, and, and what we fail to do is we fail to realize what is the truth and what is a lie. Because we just kind of we're so whatever, for whatever reason, we all do it, self-included. So uh, we're all in this constant state of, of tending our gardens, so to speak, right? And, and I want you to picture this, okay, because this is where we're going to go, that, that you and I have this thing growing, this garden that we're tending. And whether we tend it well or whether we ignore it and don't tend it well will determine whether our garden looks like this or whether it looks like this, right? Uh, so, you know, you and I, when we allow, uh, when we neglect is one, but when we allow all this other stuff to accumulate, and how many of y'all know this stuff didn't get this way in one day? You know what I'm saying? I mean, a lot of it just starts out with one thing, one thing, and, and, and we're constantly purposely planting things in our garden, or we're just letting whatever grows in our garden grow. So I don't know of any gardener, serious gardener, who's ever gone in and planted dandelions in their garden. And, oh, I can't wait until they turn all white and puffy. They're so pretty. And then they take over everything and choke out the fruit. Now, you know, so I'm, and I'm not being, you know, anti-dandelion or anything. But I want you to understand that, that, that there are certain things in our garden, so to speak, that we don't, you know, we don't want growing there because the fruit of it doesn't necessarily, uh, it's not the fruit we're after, right? And so, so what happens is, is just like these weeds in this garden begin to choke out the fruit that we're after, bad thoughts, wrong thoughts begin to choke out the fruit that you and I are after. And what we, what we don't realize and what we do so much is that we hope God will come and tend our garden, even though he's given you and I the responsibility and the authority to do it. So I'm, you know, I planted a garden. I've shared this with y'all and y'all laughed at me a lot last summer. I think it was two summers ago. I tried gardening again. And my garden ended up looking like this every time. My wife can grow anything, anywhere, and it's beautiful. I just don't like gnats and, and sun, and so my garden always gets taken over, right? But the reality is, is, that, is that in the gardens of our mind, uh, just as deliberately as you have to tend a garden and make it fruitful, we have to do the same thing here. And, and, and if you don't believe that the enemy will come and try to sow uh, lies, uh, analogy-wise, weeds in your garden, then, then you're already at a disadvantage. You have to know that the enemy wants your garden to be unfruitful. That is one of God's first commands to, to man, is to go, be fruitful, and multiply, right? Uh, and, and, and that's one of the things that Satan doesn't want. He doesn't want our lives to be fruitful because he hates you, and he wants you dead. So there you go. That's the bad news, right? Uh, it wasn't in my notes, but I guess it's making sure it ain't. You see how I do? Hmm. Okay, so so anyway, here's the here here's where we get into some of the detail. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. I want you guys to to realize, and, and and some of this stuff is really amazing. Some of it's cutting edge. Some of y'all know it. Some of you don't. But but through um, modern technology, right? Through medical advance, through different studies, smart people that really love and care about this, they've figured out that thoughts, and I'm, I'm just saying this generically, when you think something, if you think it enough and you reinforce it enough, even when you first think it, it's weak, but it's there. But do you know thoughts are real things? Yeah. I mean, physically real things. They're not, it's not, you don't just think something and, and, it, and it just it's sort of out there. There's no out there. You know where out there is? Out there is in there. You, you have a brain, and it's the physical residence of your mind. And when you think thoughts, little things, and they really do. I've seen the videos of them. They look like little trees begin to grow. So they, they, they branch off. They just look like a little tree. And the more you reinforce thinking that thought, the more you reinforce that thing, the bigger, the stronger, and the deeper it actually forms, more physical, more substantial in our brains. And so sometimes we think that what we think is just sort of out there and harmless. The reality is, is what you and I think is that they become physical parts of our physical body, and it's how God designed us. Right. So this isn't me going all crazy science on you. This is just me saying that they figured out that that why do we struggle in our thoughts so much? Because when we think 
we begin to grow things just like if you plant in a garden a tomato bush and a tomato bush pops up and has tomatoes, you wouldn't be surprised. Well, the same thing is true for us. We figured it out that, that we know now that if you think a thought and you water a thought and you grow a thought, you'll end up reaping eventually an action. You know, and what's the old saying? Uh, man, I don't think I'll ever forget this one. You, you know, you sow a thought. Uh, reap an act, sow an act, reap a habit, reap a habit, you know, now you've got a lifestyle, that kind of thing. And so as we begin to do these things, you know, we need to understand that we're in a cycle. We're always in a cycle. God works in cycles. You know that? I, I, think, I think it was later on in the, uh, in the Genesis 2 scripture where it talks about uh, that after he wasn't going to curse the land, but, but that there would always be uh, summer and winter, cold and, and, and hot, uh, uh, planting and harvesting, those type things. And so we begin to see this cycle forming, and there's always this cycle going on in our soul. It starts with thoughts, thoughts that become physical things. Those physical things in our brain cause emotion. Making sense? So because we think something and we reinforce something long enough, it is physical, has a presence, causes a reaction that we feel as an emotion, and then out of those emotions, we end up doing something. Whether it's you couldn't keep your mouth shut at the store, whether it's you couldn't bite your tongue when you knew you should have, whether it's you decided to punch that guy in the face, whatever it is, you know, uh, and, and that's on the bad side, right? So let's be positive, whether it's you chose to bridle your tongue, that you chose to bless someone instead of curse someone, those type things. All this stuff happens in this cycle. And so what we have to understand is that, that these thoughts that we have, this is why it's important that we rely on having the mind of Christ, that we sow into our gardens God's word, God's promise. We've talked about this, that we confess the word of God over our life versus repeating what other people say about me. If you spend your life reinforcing, you know, I'm, I'm going to say this because y'all might not. I still am hung up on some of the things that I was hung up on when I was 13 years old. I'm serious. And, and I know there's at least two of you that are like me. You just, you, you just you can't get past it. You know what I'm saying? That guy told me I couldn't, and I struggle with it, and I must, I can't, right? I always say, I can't do math. That's the dumbest thing I've ever said. I could do math. I don't like math. I'm not going to do math, right? But the truth is, if I wanted to do math, I could do math just as good as any math person if I put enough effort into it. And so, but sometimes we get caught up in these things, right? We get caught up in what we think we can't do, what we think that we know, how we think it's okay. You might have grown up in a house where it's okay to say whatever you want to say, and that's just keeping it real. That's a lie. That ain't keeping it real. That's you being a jerk. It's, it doesn't have nothing to do with that, right? It's not. You have to understand that you're called to live biblically, not by the wrong thoughts that got sown into your garden a long time ago. This is redemption. This is us saying that I don't have to do what I've always done and get the same emotions and the same actions as I've always gotten. I don't have to do that. All right. And so when we look at this cycle, we say, OK, look, uh, you know, just like we do that, we need to understand. Check this out. It says um, it says this in Philippians four. Not that, I, and this is just a random example I was given, but not that I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. Think about you, because if you're like me, a lot of times you're not content. Good enough isn't good enough. And so you're constantly not content. Let's walk that one out. I'm constantly not content. Uh, it was good, but it wasn't good enough. It, w it, it was a good cake, but if it had a little more frosting on it, right, it'd just been awesome. Or, you know, I thank you for the ice cream, but you could have put some sprinkles on it. Uh, all these different things, and that thought bears in our mind. And as we think that thought, it grows. And as we think that thought, it gets deeper and reinforces. And we begin to, and, and we begin to think that way over everything, whether it's ice cream, whether it's a new car, whether it's how your wife dresses or looks, how, how your husband acts, whether he does this or that. You reinforce that thing, and you constantly begin to do it, and you get the same emotion, you get the same action, you stay on the same wheel, and you wonder, can't there be more to life than this? Yes, there can be more to life than this, but you got to change something in your garden for it to be more than this. Because we create our own realities in these thoughts the more we think and think and think. And, and, and especially if they're painful thoughts, I believe it was Dr., uh, uh, I think it was Robert, um, uh, one of them Roberts, uh, the marriage guy, Robert, uh, no, Jimmy Evans. 
I think it. I think I was listening to him, and he, and and now I forgot what he said because I was trying to think of his name. But he said something that was good. Y'all just look at his stuff on YouTube. Um, whatever it was, he said it, and it was smart. Oh, I know. What he, I know what he said. He said. Uh, he said that that God, uh, God, or no, I'm sorry. Sorry, Satan loves to speak to us in our place of pain. Right. And, and, and it's that I was like, oh, that's good. I mean, it's so simple, but it's so true. Right. That, that it's in those places of pain in our garden that Satan still loves to whisper. You're not good enough, you know, or or or, or they might say something that is slightly critical. And you'll hear, you see, they never really loved you. And, and, and you start to process these things. And we can't even hear what we're hearing. And I know I know I'm just going to I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but. I'm a man, and I think the other men will hear what I'm saying, that sometimes when the way we think, uh, we always get in trouble because we love to claim that we are hearing what the women in our life are saying, but we're not hearing what they're saying. We're hearing what we want to hear. Amen? You know what I'm saying? So y'all thought I was going to talk bad about the women, but I'm actually talking bad about the guys, that, that when my wife says to me, why didn't you? Why didn't you? It could be simple. Why didn't you wash the pan in the sink? And you know what I hear? Why are you so lazy? And I'm like, I ain't lazy. She said, I didn't say you were lazy. You did say I was lazy. I heard you. You said, why didn't I wash the pan in the sink? That means why are you so lazy? But if you think that, you know what I'm saying? Because these things begin to take over. They hijack everything. And we can't act or react to anybody around us because our garden is so weeded that, that, that nothing can fall on the good soil, right? And so we, we have a job to do. All of us, we have a job to do. And that is to realize that some of the things, I'm not saying everything that happens, that the enemy is still attacking. He's still working against us. He wants to steal. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. But sometimes he enlists you and I in that process in our own life. And he, he just gives us the seed. Here's the seed. Here's the seed. And we just keep throwing it down in our garden because we don't take it into captivity, which is where I'm going now. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5 says this. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments... And every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So this is the, you know, you want to know, you want to say, okay, well, how do I do that? You, you have to take every thought captive. You and I have to decide whether we're going to let that thought gain any ground. Because the truth of the matter is, it, I, I've seen it on the little microscopic videos, that a thought will come up like a tree, but it's very faint. And if it doesn't get any reinforcement, it just it kind of goes away. I guess it's somehow we're wired, right? So, so, so we think it, it goes away if we don't give it any, any more thought. But the more you think of it, the more you think of it, the more you think of it, the more reinforced it gets, more reinforced it gets. I have some trees in my garden that have been growing for 40 years now. And I got to chop them suckers down because they don't belong. Amen. It had been a whole lot easier to get them when they were a seed. So here's the deal. When we take these thoughts captive, this is what I really want us to grab a hold of. That part of our problem is, is that we try to handle things that aren't ours to handle. Okay? And when you and I try to handle the things that belong to God, it destroys our soul. And so here, here, here's where I'm saying that from. That, that th there are things that God says no to. God tells us that, that vengeance is not ours, that ultimate justice is not ours, that we're not supposed to have bitterness, we're not supposed to have rage, we're not supposed to have malice. So there are things that God said belong to him, and there are things that God says leave alone, and when we try to handle those things, then it destroys our soul. Doesn't, I didn't say go to hell. It destroys our soul. Those things, when we try to take them on, they will take over our garden and render it fruitless so fast our heads will spin. And so when you and I run into the person that does us wrong and we decide that we want to, this is, here you go, I'm sorry, but this is going to hurt. Uh, 
what happens is, is we decide that we are all-knowing, that we are all-seeing, and that we are all-powerful, and so we become judge, jury, and executioner on the people around us, and what happens is, is because we think we know everything, we make assumptions about people, that everything they do is against us, we end up condemning them, and we end up judging them, and, event, and ultimately, here's the problem for us, is what that does is that, tries, that shows us that we're trying to get into God's throne, God's seat, God's position, handling the things that are God's. And there is, this, there is an account in the Bible uh, about the worst decision ever in history by an angel that decided he wanted to be on God's seat, and it did not work out well. And so when I act like that, who am I acting like? I'm not acting like my father. I'm acting like Satan. And I think it feels really, really just of me. Because I am so smart, and I am so observant, and I am, you know, I know I know a lot, I, I, and I'm just do something, I mean, something silly, but it can be something, you know, something as silly as, oh, I use this a lot, this must irk me, people pulling out in front of you, right? You're going down the highway, they pull out, they're going slow, and you have to move your foot all eight inches over to that brake pedal, and it sends you into a tailspin like nothing else, oh my gosh! I have been in my car, and I've only lived a couple of places, but I'll be like, I hate North Carolina. I'm like, what does that have to do with North Carolina? <laughs> Nothing. People pull out in front of people everywhere. All over the world, they do it. All of a sudden, I hate my car. I hate this drive. I don't know why I have to go there. These people hate me, and they're just dumb, and if God will wipe out every person on the planet, then then that would be ridiculous, but that's your thinking, right? That's how we do. We go all over the place, and, and I've, I've condemned this prayer. I don't know. Maybe they're just laid back. Maybe they're all peaceful and happy. Maybe they do hate me, but what does it matter if they do, right? It doesn't matter what their motive is. The problem is that I allowed those things to be sown in my garden, and those things don't bear the fruit that God wants to bear. God wants my fruit to be that of peace, joy, Right? All those things that the Holy Spirit brings to us, yet I'm constantly planting uh, uh, dandelions where I'm supposed to be planting squash and tomatoes. Amen? Because he wants me to bear fruit, bear things that are good. And, and, and I wonder, why do I struggle with this stuff so much? Well, it's because simply I'm trying to handle the things that God said he would handle. And i got to keep my hands off of them. And I don't know what those things are if I don't read my word. If I don't have it in me, I don't know that they're God's. God, I would not know that vengeance is not mine had I not read it in the Bible. I grew up as an atheist, and I thought vengeance was mine. I was the guy you did not want to do wrong because I would s s scheme and plot trying to figure out how you needed to be repaid, and I was fine doing it, right? So, so the answer is that, 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 hey, man, God says that vengeance. Why? Because that's not mine. Because it will be unjust if I do it. It won't be fair. It won't take into consideration all the facts because only one knows all the facts. Only one can judge rightly, and only one uh, has a decision whether to uh, condemn or not. Amen? And that's not me, and I don't frankly want that seat. All right? So let's look at this verse in, in wrapping up here, Philippians 4, 8. And I want to leave you with this because this is the answer. This is what you can do. If you want to know, okay, that's all good. What can I do? Well, it says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. You can write these down if you want to on your hand if you need to. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So, so, so it's kind of funny how all of this, and I'm telling you, I'll, I'll give you a name real quick. You could jot this name down, Dr. Caroline Leaf. If you have never heard of her, check out her stuff. She's, one, she's a, a neuroscientist that all this stuff that I said, it took me, it took me nine hours for my brain to, like, I almost had to put it on ice watching her stuff. <laughs> she's real smart, and I'm really not that smart. So I get what she's saying, but, but she's the one that talks about the reality of these thoughts and how they play out and how they're formed physically in our brain. She's a neuroscientist, and, and she's a Christian, and she just loves to talk about how God formed our brains and how we can help. She's got some great, great stuff. But the point of it is, is, is in her writings, she said, you know, I even heard her say it, that the funny thing is that, that it's really as simple as doing what the Scripture said, that, that if we would just understand that we are to fixate and think about on things that are true and honorable and right and pure 
and lovely and admirable, things that are excellent and things that are worthy of praise, that it, it would begin a detox in our brain. All the stink would begin to come off. All those things, all those wrong thoughts would begin to dry up and die. And because our thoughts are right, the reality is our emotions will line up. And, and out of our thoughts and our emotions, our actions will line up. And that we can have a cycle of life versus a cycle of death. That we can live in the abundance of God's goodness and not always wish that we did like so-and-so did. Here's the problem, though, uh, and, and it comes back into this, that I said in the beginning that, that God said he would sanctify us, right? So here's the, here's the thing. He says he himself will sanctify you through and through. The method that he gave us to be sanctified is that scripture in James 1.21. So get rid of all filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted or the implanted word of God for it has the power to save your souls. So he says, I'm going to sanctify you, but I need you to partner with me. I need you to put my word in you, and I need you to put filth away from you. I need you to put evil away from you. I need you to become a gardener of your mind. I need you to think on the things that I'm telling you to think about, and I'm telling you to leave alone the things that don't have the, the ability to bear any good fruit in your life. So for you and I, if you're like me, and you feel like you just got crud, just built up, right? Then, then the answer is dig in. Don't, please don't stop with this sermon. There's no way we can talk in one morning the depth of this. Uh, there are books. There are all those things. I gave you the lady I listened to about it. There's a bunch of great, uh, uh, great messages and on these things. But if we dig in and we realize that a lot of our problems stem from our thought garden. That, that, then we can begin to begin become free and have life in our souls because we're in the right place. Amen? God didn't want us to put away filth and evil because he wants to deprive us of filth and evil. God wanted us to put away filth and evil because in the absence of those things, the fruitfulness of God will abound in our life. And we'll begin to see those things that we long in our heart and in our soul to see. Amen? I want you to... Um, I want you to think about this with me. I have a scripture. And right now, I'm just being transparent. I'm about to invite you, if you haven't received Christ, to do that. If, you, if you've never trusted your life to him. You see, the funny thing is, is we were going into February. And, you know, of course, I felt obligated to do a message. It's Valentine's month, right? We were going to talk about love and relationships. With all these beautiful things. They are beautiful. And I thought, man, are you really going to do detox in February? Felt like it's what God wanted me to do. But you know what? I found that in this is the greatest Valentine's story. You see, in this, it, amen, that in this we see how God loved us, not just sending his son to die for us, not just giving us a way out of hell, but really loving us because he gave us his son even his mind, even the redemptive power of the mind of Christ to give us life, real life now. And I thought, man, I've loved a lot of people, but, and, and I've had people love me, but no one has loved me like that. No one has loved me like God has loved me. No one has looked past an offense greater than God has in my life. So when you talk about Valentine's Day and love, man, God's love is, is immeasurable. In, I, in Isaiah 51, uh, this, this is something that the Lord speaks to Israel, but, but it's for you and I. And, there, and I want to talk to both crowds now, those of you who have received Christ and those who haven't. Verse 3 in Isaiah 51 says, The Lord will comfort Israel again. And have pity on her ruins. Her desert will blossom like Eden. Her barren wilderness like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found there. Songs of thanksgiving will fill the air. And see, either way, you could be on either side of this thing. And, and you, can, you can be in this barren place. Without Christ, we are spiritually dead. And we're barren. 
It doesn't matter what our lives look like on the outside. We need him to have life. So I want to pray with you in a minute. But I also want to speak to you if you're here and you're like, I have been saved. I love Jesus, but I swear I live in a desert. My, my, my garden is full of weeds. My life is as barren as it can be. The only reason I follow Christ is because I don't have another answer. I just don't see the fruit in my life. Well, God's given you the answer today. His implanted word in you can save your soul. And so this promise to Israel is, is, is still the heart of the promises for us. That the desert will blossom like Eden. Can you imagine that? That the barren wilderness, like the garden of the Lord, joy and gladness will be found there. That's the fruit you receive. And songs of thanksgiving will be sung there. A place of joy, a place of fruit, a place of, of, of fruitfulness can be yours. And God wants to help you get there. Here's the thing. He just wants you to partner with him. You got to put the word in. You got you to gotta think on these things like we shared. And that's where you can begin to trust and learn. Do these things. You got to do it. Amen? Got to do it. You got one final thing. Think on these things. That's it. That's it. And if it isn't one of those things, then, then just throw that bag of seeds away. You throw, the, throw, throw the seeds away that the enemy gives you that say you're not good enough. Throw the seeds away that say that your sins are too big. Throw, your, throw, throw you the seeds away when the enemy tells you that you've done too much wrong, that you, you just can't get it right. Throw those seeds away and think on these things. Think on things that are true, which is what? That, that for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. That, 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 that he knows the thoughts that he has for you, good thoughts. They're not bad thoughts. Amen? And so, so God knows what he thinks of you, and, and he tells you what he thinks of you, so don't think anything else of yourself other than what God thinks. Amen? I want you to do this with me. If you're here this morning and you haven't prayed and received Christ, that you haven't invited him into your heart, then I want to pray with you this morning. Whether you're here or whether you're online with us, either way, I just want you to boldly do this because it's, it's in your heart that you believe. You probably have already done that, but it's with your mouth you confess and are saved. So just pray this prayer after me if that's you. And if you're here, just do me a favor. Hold your hand up so I know who I'm praying with. Uh, you just boldly slip it up if there's anybody. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for sending your son. I know I've sinned. I know I've made a mistake. And I've missed you. Lord, I just invite you into my life. I invite you to save me. I ask you to bring me into yourself like a son or daughter and give me life. I'll follow you the rest of my days. I ask you to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. Awesome. Good deal.